You're listening to Market the Brew, a leading resource for promoting and marketing craft beer. Join in as we share with you, straight from the source, tools and strategies craft brewers from around the country are using right now to achieve significant success. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Very Happy to be, to be here. here. We, we love these types of things. So. <laughs> so I'm going to start by asking you to introduce yourself and the name of the brewery. Perfect. Uh, I'll kick off. I'm David Hom. I'm the founder of Lost Worlds Brewing. We're located in Cornelius, North Carolina. And with me, I have... Gary Johnson. <laughs> How did you guys get the name for Lost Worlds Brewing? So Lost Worlds, I have a love of archaeology, history, adventure, and... Uh, as I was looking at starting a craft brewery, one of the things that kept coming back is I wanted to immerse several of my interests. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about brand a little bit later, but you, you want to have a brand that you kind of align yourself with. And Lost Worlds for us kind of denotes lost civilizations, lost communities, lost societies, lost locations around the world. And what we're trying to do through our brewery is part of our brand is to let people find their adventure and bring forth those kind of, you know, those locations, those societies as communities that are kind of forgotten let that be their exploration through our brewery and how did you guys get into the brewing scene so for me i was uh, home brewing about 25 years ago got one of those homebrew kits with charlie papazian's book in it and started brewing and loved it just continued doing it through the years and uh, by trade i am a uh, business consultant i specialize specifically in how to innovate companies and to be honest, it just got burned out. Um, corporate America just kind of drove the soul out of me and I decided I wanted to do something a little bit different. So when I looked around, I always loved beer. And, you know, the barest entries for craft brewing has fallen substantially over the last couple of years, uh, really over the last 10 years. And for me, it was a very an easy jump is, you know, what can we do? Can we create something that's worth creating? And, I, and what I mean by that is, can we create a brewery that's unique, that has a brand, that has great beer that has a community what can we do that's different and if we can do that we check the boxes while we were sitting at sherry's dining room table then we decided to jump into it we've heard a lot of people start with the homebrew kit and then create an entire business around it <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah, charlie, charlie deserves a lot of royalties these days well, and I think <laughs> after a few more of these interviews we might be hopping on that too <laughs> oh, no. sounds kind of fun <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. One of the ways that Dave and I got aligned initially, we'd worked on other businesses together. Um, and then when he said, do you have any interest in, in looking at a craft brewery or talking about doing a craft? I said, I started my career at Miller Brewing in Milwaukee. Oh, wow. I've been in marketing my whole career. And um, I lived in, I lived in Milwaukee for 10 years. I've lived as a, it was an easy fit to like <laughs> do this together. And, and, you know, we really did start the initial branding at my dining room table. <laughs> so <laughs> come a long way. Right. So you started brewing at home. Uh, what kind of system do you have now? So we have a Deutsche system now. And I mean, the, the, the gap between that little kind of plastic container and the glass cardboard, what we're doing today is, is you know, night and day. Uh, but we've, uh, Deutsche is, was based out of Charlotte. And we started, you know, looking at uh, all the equipment we were going to need. We really couldn't go any further because they weren't going to lose our business. I mean, they were right around the corner from us. And um, we did a lot of, I have, we have a very experienced brewer. Uh, his name's David Gonzalez. We call him DG. DG's been brewing in Charlotte for about 30 years. And wow. so he's like the grandfather of North Carolina brewing. So we sat down with Deutsche and really kind of worked with them to kind of engineer their system to what we wanted to do for us, knowing that, you know, the types of beers you want to brew, the styles and how we want to emphasize the quality. So uh, they've been a very tight partnership for us since day one. Uh, we have a 10 barrel brew house. I think today we have 140 barrels of fermenters and brights. Wow. And then distribution-wise, do you guys work with anybody, or do you guys just do it all yourselves? Today was well. It's interesting, like hearing breweries from all different states and all the different laws. Mm -hmm. Just from Wisconsin, it seems so easy for us to get beer and <laughs> distribute beer, and then hearing different states, the different challenges that distribution has. Absolutely, and I mean, uh, I we owe a lot of credit to 
we have some outstanding partners, and that would be, uh, first of all, the North Carolina Craft Brewers Grilled, because a lot of the laws in, in North Carolina, as in many states, are antiquated. They date back to prohibition. And they've been, uh, with their lobbyists, have been key in helping us kind of modernize the laws and the regulatory environment. In addition to that, uh, Sherry worked on a movement here in Charlotte called the uh, Free Craft Beer Movement. I think I got that right. And uh, Sherry, you might want to speak to about a little bit about how that changed the dynamics of our industry here in North Carolina. Yeah, they were. It was called Craft Freedom, and it was spearheaded by one of the first big breweries in town. And I worked on the PR side of it a little bit, but um, there were so many regulations that were really prohibiting, you know, distribution over a certain number of barrels. And they really helped to change those laws and um, and really kind of made things better. And in addition to you know combining forces with the North Carolina Brewers Guild to kind of get where we're at today, which is you know much better than it was. So. It's come, it's come a long mm-hmm. way. That's awesome. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I got it. Um, so your ingredients, how do you go about sourcing your ingredients for the, for your brews? And what is the significance of using like your locally sourced or unique ingredients in your beers? Gotcha. So we were, when we opened up Lost Worlds, one of the things we didn't want to do is go to the menu and you have eight IPAs and two other beers. <laughs> So from the beginning, we've kind of emphasized having a lot of styles. You know, we were bringing a Schwartz beer before. That's kind of come back in the popularity. But we'll always have a Pilsner. We were having, you know, um, just a variety of different beers all over the place. And so for us, sourcing from one location has been very, very tough. You know, if you're doing a Pilsner or we're doing a Kolsch, invariably we're getting something from Germany at those parts. So we get ingredients from all over the place. And we're going to continue to do that just because there's just not – we could brew a, a beer or two that's specifically North Carolina ingredients, but we couldn't do a beer that was solely North Carolina ingredients for our whole portfolio. Okay. Um, and that said, but we do look for partnerships like our coffee beer. Right now, we're getting ready to launch that here in January. That's brewed with uh, beans that are sourced and roasted locally with a partner called Water Bean Coffee. So we do look for those type of opportunities when we can. And what kind of sets Lost Worlds Brewing aside from other breweries with your theme and with those offerings that you mentioned? I think from the start, we knew we had to create a cohesive brand and, and, you know, Dave has a deep history in, in uh, innovation and branding um, as do I. And so we really, we knew we had to do that in addition to making award-winning beers, you know, we knew we needed a cohesive brand and we knew at the, at the core of things that at the end of the day, we're an entertainment company. So, you know, we really, we operate on the theme of find your adventure. You know, we provide this aspirational environment for people, whether it's the names of our beers or things that might inspire people to get out and see the world and go do something. We try to bring all those experiences into our tap room, um, which makes us a a little different because we do, I think, a pretty thoughtful job of weaving that through um, everything we do. So it's always at the core, you know, we always, does it hold up to our brand statement, our brand mission? If it doesn't, we don't do it. So, um, you know, one example of that would be we have taproom artifacts um, that we place in our in our taproom, which are tied to the name of a beer. So we might um, we might have something. Well, uh, for example, our our Irish ale is called Shillelagh. And so we have a uh, we have an Irish shillelagh hanging over the door going into the tap room in the brew into the brew house. So we have an artifact flight where we identify we have four beers and each one is tied to a tap room artifact and they're um, they kind of go on a little adventure throughout our tap room and they are QR codes around the artifacts and they have to kind of read about the story and then if they answer questions and get them right they get a prize from the, one of our adventure guides. So oh it gives God. people that experiential element but and having fun while tasting new beers yeah it's something different like when we go to breweries sometimes you just kind of sit you chat enjoy your beer yeah that'd be fun like it's just beyond the beer it's something different and it definitely draws people's attention well, yeah. sure you, you learn a little I mean, something along the way too time. we're evolving <laughs> we're evolving from a brewery to become an entertainment company and some of our partnerships and the things that we're doing to get people engaged no one, I mean, we didn't want to be that brewery when we started that you can walk into a hundred different breweries and you really can't tell what the name is or what they're all about. We didn't want to fall into that bucket. So Lost Worlds is all about emphasizing that history, that archaeology, the adventure, the travel. So it's it's core to us from everything from the names of our beers to the way our taproom looks. And it seems too like 
talking about how you can go through and scan the QR codes and talk about the artifacts, I feel like that could also start conversations with the people in the tap room, with the staff, and you start to build that community in your brewery. I like that a lot. Absolutely. And we, we call our beer tenders adventure guides, and they <laughs> know all the stories about the tap room artifacts, why the beer's named the way they are. And we hide Easter eggs and everything. So, you know, they know where some of the Easter eggs are. So they can let our guests know, like, hey, we actually hid this on the can label. This is what that signifies. <laughs> so we try to make it fun. That's awesome. I love that. <clears throat> so, yeah, your brewery seems to have a strong connection to adventure and uh, exploration. How does this theme influence your beer selection and overall experience you provide to, like, your customers? Gotcha. Well, I, I think beyond the story is when we're looking at our beers, depending upon the background of where that beer comes from, that really helps us drive what the name is. All of our beers are named after a specific individual, a specific location, an item, or uh, or like a time period or something like that. So if you take something like our Vista, Vista is named for Hiram Bingham when he first saw Machu Picchu for the first time. He talks about in his diary about the amazing Vista he saw. So that's a, a West Coast IPA. Um, more recently, we did uh, what's called Mata Wheel. It's our Mexican lager. Mata Wheel, we worked with a lot of archaeologists, and it was the name was actually suggested by one of the archaeologists. Mata Wheel has, uh, going back into kind of um, the Mayan lore, it has a little bit, it's kind of like their nirvana, but it also kind of has an element about drinking. So it's like drinking nirvana, and so it kind of played very well, and like we love the name, and so actually the beer is like the, the can label has the glyphs, from that how they first identified Mata Wheel was something in the Mayan lore. So wow. it's all those things that kind of fall together. And I can't say there's any one process we ever follow. It's kind of reached now like I have before reached out and said, hey, we have a beer. It's coming from this part of the world. Give me some suggestions on names. And the archaeologists start throwing the names at us. So we have a lot of fun with it. That's probably one thing they did not expect in their job as an archaeologist was yeah. naming beer. <laughs> but God, right. they if embrace you... it. They embrace it. <laughs> they they do. They do. And if you can't tell, we're huge geeks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, though. This is amazing. <laughs> and then on the adventure and exploration, uh, we saw that you guys just went to Oktoberfest. Were you two part of that group that went there? <laughs> wow. That's one yes, of our, we were. That, that, that's one of our places that, like on our bucket list to go. So <laughs> You got to do it. You got to do it. We, we, we call it research. So <laughs> we were on a research mission. We learned a lot. We brought a lot of uh, a fun details back to our tap room. We have two big Oktoberfest events that we've become known for since opening mm -hmm. in 2020. And um, we have a lot of fun. And so everything from pretzel necklaces to, you know, the, the band is amazing. We do stein holding contests. And <laughs> what else, Dave? We, it, what else did we learn? Thing. It's a big party. <laughs> and uh, this, this next year, we're going to really ramp up to the next level. Uh, we do things called markets and uh, we have a big backlog behind us but during COVID, we found that a lot of artisans didn't really have the ability to you know sell their wares so we put booths in the back during COVID, and it kind of kicked off what we call our markets so next year we're weaving our oktoberfest with the markets so it's gonna be like a huge weekend of having yeah. all the artists and that type of stuff kind of beer focused but then in oktoberfest with the band and you know all the food and fare that comes with all that oh so my god we'll weekend. do it we should come down yeah, that's what I was going to say. Come on down. We do it the opening day of Oktoberfest in Munich, Germany. So we pair it with the same day. And we also have the mayor of our town, Cornelius, come and tap our first keg, just like they do in Munich. Oh, wow. Huh. So it really is like Oktoberfest <laughs> in your town. In exactly. Cornelius, North Carolina. Exactly. <laughs> we might have to go there like a halfway point right. to the real one. <laughs> Again, there research, right? <laughs> yeah, <pretty easy. laughs> And then can you share some insight on the process of developing and brewing uh, the beers that are inspired by the uh, mythical settings and creatures and everything? Yeah, so we do research. And um, I'll, I'll tell you one. So I talked about Madhu a little bit either, so that's a good example. But uh, Polke is um, kind of national drink of Mexico, was occupying Mexico. or not occupying is the right word, but really heavily influential in Mexican politics. Polke is their traditional drink, though. And so... You know, we learned about this and said, you know what, let's give it a shot. So we make a we made a polke beer, which is a derivative of what the old polke is, but put our little spin out with like agave nectar and stuff in it as well. So we do those types of things because I think people, you know, it goes back to our brand. Part of your exploration of the world 
is understanding the, the drinks that people consume. And that for us, it was kind of, can we pull something out of Mexico, weave it together with the Cinco de Mayo celebration and give them something that's kind of a native drink. So that's an example of something that we've done. On um, the Mata Wheel is another one example, but even our Kolsch, our Kolsch, you know, it's named after a Korfman, Max Korfman, who was the uh, archaeologist who excavated Troy. Um, we used to kind of try to use ingredients that we got from not only that part of the world, but also kind of having a little bit of a, a Turkish element to it. Um, so we do all those types of things to make things especially unique and make them, you know, from lost worlds. Wow. And you've mentioned so many of these different names and the inspirations behind them. And after talking to a lot of different breweries in these podcasts, they mentioned how hard it is to come up with names that are so unique. Have you found that your brew or your beers have the only name or have you found that a lot of different breweries have used that name? Uh, I don't think we don't have any problem with it. First of all, we come up with stuff all the time <laughs> and I think we have very unique names. You know, I'm not, you're not going to find a model wheel Mexican lager anywhere because we know the archeologist who found the glyph. And <laughs> I mean, it's that, so it's, it's It'd be odd if you found that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If it really is, we want to like, I want to talk to the guy who has that beer. Cause like, where did you get that from? How did that happen? So um, there always is some, I mean, we have one of our beers, our, our, Core beers is called Euchre, and it's named after the card game. And we talk about the history of where Euchre came from because, you know, it's uh, – and, and our story with Euchre is there was uh, 19 uh, – so, there you go. Sure, you showing it to you. 19, I'm ha I, have your, I have your prop, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> there was 19 individuals who were shipwrecked. It was a half German, half American crew. They're on an iceberg uh, for about six months. In the past time, they played Euchre. Well, Euchre is a very popular card game. You guys, I'm sure, know about living in uh, – Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. There is, I have seen there's another Euchre out there, but we're not in the same markets and that type of stuff. And I mean, if there was ever an issue, I'm sure we could work out a perfect agreement for it because we're not going to distribute that past North Carolina. But um, that's the only time I've ever seen something that's kind of similar name. Other than that, our names are so unique that, I mean, I'm okay with it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And one of the ways we bring this to life, like actually this afternoon, today, we have a Euchre uh, tournament going on Ooh. in the tap room. So we have monthly Euchre tournaments um, that we host, and it ends up being a lot of people from Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin that come get together and um, play cards and have a great time and enjoy Euchre Gold Nail. And um, they leave, we, we crown a winner, they leave with, you know, our merch and a deck of Euchre cards and after a fun day of, of, of playing with friends. And it's just, it's just a good time. But it's one of the ways we bring kind of everything together as a brand and, and make it all sing. You guys really go beyond the beer. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to have fun. Else why would you do it? You know? Yes. Right. So another significant part of your brewery is collaboration. Have you been collaborating with different breweries in your area or can you touch a little bit on that? So collaboration is key to us because if you're building a community, it helps us stretch our audience to have other people pulled in. Um, we've done collaboration with breweries. We probably got, I don't know, 10 or so in the last three years uh, more recently. Uh, and sometimes we do that for a number of reasons. One is because we don't really do sours, uh, but we work partnered with a brewery who did do sours to create a, a, a goso with us. Um, mm -hmm. We've done things that those beers that people don't normally buy. And I'll say, like, like, I love a smoked beer. Every brewer loves a smoked beer. They just don't sell down here in North Carolina. So uh, with one of our brewery partners, uh, Town Brewing, we did a Grotzer, you know, a smoked Polish wheat beer. So we love to, you know, we really try to find those connections with boys when we can do something unique. Like right now, I'm trying to put together a little group that will do um, another smoked beer just because they don't sell well. And But, you know, I love having on tap, and we all like to go to each other's places and drink those types of beers, but they're just not... Not commercial. Um, yeah, yeah. Before we get into like community partners, though, we also do collaborations with. Um, we did one with a book author, so this is our Mech Deck Honey Ale, and that is we partnered with a book launch. He, uh, Dave Fleming, um, he oh lives, he's local and he's a guest of the brewery and and a good friend, and he wrote a book called Who's Your Founding Father, which talks about the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. We live in Mecklenburg County, so when he launched his book. Um, we got together and we brewed a beer and we used water from the Freedom Spring that he talks about in his book that dates 
back to wow. 17. What, are, what, Dave, help me out here with dates. You know, I'm bad with this. 1775. <laughs> 17, 1775, because we're coming up on the uh, 250th anniversary. But anyway, so that's a good example of a, of a collaboration that we did that was wildly successful. The beer is delicious. And we used Mecklenburg um, honey in the beer as well as, you know, we hosted the day of his book launch and had a book signing and a Q and A with the author. And, you know, we, that, wow. that beer, we still have, I think, I think we just kind of might've just ran, ran out of it. I'm not sure, but it was delicious, but that's a great part uh, example of a collaboration that didn't involve another brewery. Um, but we also, we other, other collaborations that we do are ones with um, community partners. So we work with the Carolina Raptor center this month. We're doing a roundup for Raptors, um, partnership, but they do a lot of conservation. Um, we support the conservation that they, um, an education that they do out at their center, which is not far from here. Uh, we have other community partners. Um, we have an archaeological, of course, society, because like I said, we're giant geeks. So American <laughs> Foreign Academic Research um, they are, uh, we, that's near and dear to our hearts because we, our kids both participated in that as they were growing up through high school. They take high school um, kids on archaeolo real archaeology digs, and wow. uh, Dave, you're, Dave sat on the board for many years, and so there were location. Our Zarita Hazy IPA is named after one of the sites, oh, and cool. uh, and that's in Zarita, Spain. But um, we, our partnerships run deep, and our collaborations run deep, and it allows us to tell more stories because at the end of the day, we're a story brand. So. We, we, we weave that in through many, 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 in many, many different ways, but that is just one of the ways that we kind of collaborate with our community partners too. Wow. Well, and usually like when you talk about business, people are so competitive and everyone's trying to be the best. And then when we talk to breweries, everyone is so supportive of one another mm -hmm. and yeah. to have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very much so. And it happens all the time. We trade ingredients with them. We trade equipment. Uh, we're doing a barrel aged beer right now, and we're it's our first foray into that. And uh, from that perspective, we're borrowing stuff from everyone to do it. It's like someone else's <laughs> bottle filler, someone's labeler. It's the whole thing. It's it's kind of like a, I hope the cops don't come out in the back there. Like where get everyone else's equipment from. So yeah, <laughs> well, it's nice to hear that that carries over in North Carolina too. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so you guys host like a lot of events, like you said, so from Euchre events and everything like that, um, mm -hmm. some more memorable events that you've had or just events you've created for your customers. Oh gosh. Um, uh, beer, you want to talk about beer school, Dave? Why don't you dive into that? Yeah, that's a good one. So as I mentioned, our brewer's been doing this for 30 years and we find a lot of people are interested in the brewing industry and want to know kind of how beer is made you know, with the different ingredients in that. So we launched beer school this year. And what that is, that's the first Saturday of every month it goes for about an hour and a half. And we let you come in. Our brewer does a walkthrough about the whole brewing process. So people can understand, you know, what's the difference between an ale and a lager and, and how those lines are getting blurred today. Or, you know, after that, um, he'll go into a little bit about the different elements, the different, uh, um, what do I want to call them, vessels that are utilized in the brewing process. So after all that's done, then he takes them to a guided tasting so they can understand the different beers, the different flavor profiles, and he wraps it up with a tour with them. So that's the type of event we do on a monthly basis um, that really kind of help lets people know a little bit about more who we are. But I mean, the events for us runs the gamut. I mean, I talked about the markets a little bit earlier. We have the Oktoberfest. Um, we do those. We host Euchre tournaments. We do a lot of hosting for other people's events, everything from wedding ceremonies to graduations to um, baby showers, wedding showers, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. There's always something going on. And I think, you know, Sherry talked about our collaboration with authors. We've done a couple of those at this point now. Mm -hmm. um, an archaeology book was released, and where else would you release it but at Lost Worlds? <laughs> uh, but anything that we can think of. I mean, really, we try, you know, uh, some one of our employees asked me recently, like, I have a lot of good ideas. I'm like, okay, there's only a framework simple. One is it on brand. Two, can we execute it with excellence? And three, can we make some money off doing it? And if we can hit that, really the sky's the limit on what we'll do. We, we really will host any type of event. And uh, we're very interested in continuing to do that. I mean, it really brings the community into the brewery. How would you say 
if you if someone were to come and visit Lost World Brewing for the first time, what is something they could expect and what experience would you recommend them begin with? Something they can expect. So again, it goes back to cohesive of our brand. You got to come in, you're going to see the taproom artifacts. You're going to see that we look like an outpost on the inside that you would find someplace. Um, and then really what we want to do is the first thing is our guest service model that we take a lot of pride in that. We have a de very defined model about how we take care of our guests. And it starts from me like, uh, and we borrow it. I'll be honest with you. It came from Marriott, it came from Disney, it came from companies that are outstanding at guest services. I want people to think we have the cleanest facility around and the best guest services. But when you get in there, you know, the first thing I want you to do is understand, look in, and it, it needs to feel different from any place that you've been. So we do that with the names and kind of the discussion. So our adventure guides greet you the minute you walk in the door. And for us, they greet you like you're an old friend. And uh, come in there and immediately start, you know, what beer do you want if they haven't seen you before? And, you know, what Sherry mentioned earlier about the artifact flight, a great way to get to know us. You know, four of our beers go around to the QR codes that introduces you to our tap room. There's a map on the back of it that shows our tap room where the artifacts are hidden. So that gives people really kind of a good feel for it. Then I hope they try some beers that are unique to us. Like, you know, we do a really good black lager. It's a great beer for, you know, people who say, hey, I don't like dark beers. To me, it's the gateway beer to get them to say, you know what? I didn't really know what a dark beer could taste like. So we are, our Gossip's Black Lager is a great beer for that. But then, you know, as, as it unfolds, what I want them to feel is that spirit of community. You mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, once you start talking about these things, and you have common things that you're looking at and seeing, be it on our Taproom TV or with our Taproom Artifacts, that strikes conversations. And our adventure guides are there to kind of foster those conversations. And that's why, to, to a large extent, a lot of our beers are a little bit more sessionable. I don't want you to come in there and have a 10% beer, have two and be done. I want you to come in there and have four, 5% beers, have some great conversations, and find, you know, that extension of your life. You know, you've got your home, you got your work. Where's your third place? We want to be that third place for you. That's incredible. I don't think I've heard of any breweries that have something like this mm -hmm. where you could have those Easter eggs and the mystery and kind of the walkthrough. This is really unique and super interesting. Well, it's part of our culture. You know, one of our core values is continual innovation. And every, you know, person we hire, 90 days in, I take them to lunch. Tell me your ideas. I want to know what they are. So uh, our leadership team is, that's part of what we have to do as part of our culture is we have to be open-minded and continuously to prod each other and to poke each other. And we may not love every idea. I mean, we've tried stuff that hasn't gone well. And then we've tried stuff that's been game changers for us. Um, so that spirit of innovation is you got to just keep trying and keep chugging along and, and create a culture where that can happen and where you let people, you know, feel comfortable bringing their ideas to the market. And then the craft beer industry is obviously constantly evolving and changing. What trends or innovations do you see on the horizon for Lost Worlds Brewing and how do you um, plan to adapt to these changes? So I'm going to answer your question in two ways. The first way is how is it changing? Um, when we got into the brewing industry, there was less than 300 breweries in North Carolina. Today, there's 430. So the growth is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that can continue. And I think we're beginning to see that right now where some of the older brands are struggling and falling. I mean, I hate to bring Anchor Steam into the conversation, love their beer, but, you know, they're a casualty of all this. But I think what we've seen is because the beer is low, you can just go out and, like, pick it off a shelf, like in a grocery store. Hey, I want this, 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 and this. Where in the past, you essentially had to have a welder on staff with, you know, a dairy bed to start a brewery. Those days are gone. You know, money's coming into it. People who aren't necessarily brewers, they just think, oh, my gosh, it'd be fun to open a brewery. And so they do that. The challenge is they don't absolutely love the craft. They don't understand the beer. So I think a couple things are happening. First is the beer's hit or miss. I think we had a lot better beer on average across breweries several years ago than we do today. And so we have to differentiate ourselves. And that's a challenge. So, I mean, we talk about beer school and really kind of helping on people understand what, what's unique about beer. That's critical to us to be able to kind of separate ourselves from everyone else out there. The second piece is innovation. And Sherry mentioned this earlier. We're evolving from becoming just a brewery to becoming an entertainment company. And what are those programs that we're launching? What's the environment they're creating that people want to come there and they want to stay there? And uh, so we just did something I never thought we'd do. We just launched a cocktail program mm -hmm. uh, this past week. I, I don't love that, to be perfectly honest with you, because a beer purist, I want people to come in and drink beer. But I also recognize if people are coming in, we have to have a plus one strategy. What do we have for that person who doesn't is not a beer drinker? 
And um, so craft cocktails are that. So we're going to have three cocktails on, not a lot. We'll swap them up seasonality in that as well. We still have wine and cider, totally fine, but still we want to be focused on being a brewery. But we have to appeal to a larger audience and continue to drive more people mm -hmm. there. And I think the other thing is, you know, we've spent a lot of time on innovation. It's really that community outreach. We have to have partners out in the community and stuff that we would never thought we've done before. But um, there's so many breweries. That how are we going to stand out? We're going to stand out because we're going to reach out to that community. So if you want to have a cheer company, if you want to have a, a guided tasting there, we can do that for you. If you want us to come out, you know, to your location and, and help you throw a party, we can do these types of things. We'll help you get glassware, swag, whatever it is. So we're building programs that are extending the brewery beyond the confines of our four walls out to them as well. The last thing I, I'll say is we have to have very unique partnerships and we're launching, we've launched a couple this past year. One thing uh, we have, let's show you right here. We have a partnership with Viacom and uh, Paramount. We created wow. the first enterprise sale. So you see the Star Trek enterprise on there. Um, something that someone, you know, I don't think anyone in the industry thinks about stuff like that, but you can do these types of partnerships. Um, so these are the types of things. Thing else. That's really cool that you're going into the brewery or uh, taking your brewery into the baseball stadium. That's going to be really exciting. It's going to be fun. Yes, it will. Yeah, I was going to say what's coming up next for you guys, but. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. <laughs> you have some big plans coming up. Jump the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's all these things. I mean, there's all those things we just talked about. But I mean, I see other things in terms of can we host conferences at our brewery? And uh, we're opening a second location this year, which is closer to downtown mm -hmm. Charlotte. Um, it's right off the Greenway. And so, you know, what can we do to help people get out and bike, run, walk, you know, enjoy the outdoors? So there's always things we can figure out that we can do. Oh, you have a lot coming up. Yeah, right. That's exciting. <laughs> we keep, Sherry and I stay busy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was, I think that wraps up all of our questions mm -hmm. that we had for you today. Was there anything that we missed or anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, I feel like we've covered a lot of stuff. Yeah. I think the only other thing um, maybe was to talk about our just kind of sustainability, environmental kind of initiatives, which we um, we have a few. Um, Dave, I think you know more about the Char Why don't you talk about the Charlotte Water um yeah, so there is, driven by the EPA, there's a lot of push, and uh, I'll argue some of it's misdirected um, that at breweries because they, they're they reviewed as polluters to some extent. The ironic thing is we are probably the least polluters out there of any kind of factory. Um, when we brew our beer, we use you know the main ingredients water. We reuse that water and uh, time and time again. Uh, spent grains go to local farmers. So when we heard about this was coming down, uh, I wanted us to get involved as quickly as we could. So our brewer actually was one of the uh, uh, staff members who went in and worked with Charlotte Water to help formulate what the guidelines were and what was feasible. And uh, so we stayed on the top of that. So we're the only small brewery. You know, most of those breweries are five, 10,000 barrels, but I knew it could have downstream impacts on us. But we got involved early and helped them formulate the standards. And we were the first brewery to really kind of put those standards in place. Having said that, it was pretty easy for us because, again, all of our spent grains either go to a farmer or we're actually using them some to make dog biscuits today. Oh. And then, you know, our water, we recycle our water. You know, if we're using it for heating for one second, for cooling one second, we're going to reuse that water time and time again for cleaning or whatever. So uh, very little low profile um, for our brewery. You know, very little trash because we use glassware. We, we use all environmentally friendly chemicals. So um, trying to keep our footprint as small as possible. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible. That's really impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to do at a brewery with yeah. the amount of water and things like that. It is. I mean, you just you have to have a cycle of your water. So we mapped out where our water is used. You know, first it's used, you know, in, in this process to as a coolant. Then we're using it here from either beer or it goes into cleaning. So it's used two, three times as it goes through our process. Wow. I hope some people are listening and can reach out to you for more information if they need it, because that's something that would probably benefit them, too. Yeah, and I think Charlotte Water's done a really good job of helping us build these these cycles. So, I mean, they've been a partner. Uh, we talk about, you know, all the partners we have. It's always good to have partners with the local utilities and the local government. Um, so those are just critical to us. Wow. Oh, I've learned a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast and chatting with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. We enjoy yeah, well, these things. So. Hopefully we can make it to your Oktoberfest. That sounds like Absolutely. a blast. I think it's September. <laughs> Sending you the dates. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> see you the date. we'll see you there. 
You, it, it's you a good research up. project. Trust us. <laughs> you have to dress. You got to wear the garb, though. You got to have leader hose on. You got to have the work. So. Oh, absolutely. Deal. <laughs> and you can do the Stein holding contest. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you. you guys thank have you. Great We've reached the end of this episode, but there's plenty more to keep you busy. For online source materials and proven case studies delivered right to your inbox, sign up for our mailing list by visiting marketthebrew.com. We'll see you next time on Market the Brew.